Let's uh, look at uh, the ocean, especially because of its reduced gravity structure, where the upper ocean is strongly stratified and the deep ocean below the thermocline is very deep compared to the active upper layer and the motions are very slow and the ocean has boundaries. So we'll see uh, what uh, solutions can emerge uh, for ocean waves, especially for the boundary reflections. So there are some very interesting uh, uh, specificities to ocean solutions as compo compared to the atmosphere that we have been looking at thus far. Uh, we can write the uh, hydrostatic balance for the ocean as uh, dpdz dp uh, dz is rho g as uh, 1 over rho dp g dz uh, 1 over rho dp equal to g dz where 1 over rho is of course alpha v the specific volume and g dz is the d phi the geopotential um, we will see soon that when you have a vertical uh, stratification and multiple layers in the active uh, ocean above the thermocline you have uh, isobars which if it's a constant, uh, if it's an incompressible flow, then you can remove the pressure effects and so on, which we will not bother here. So we will write uh, phi P1 minus phi P2, we will see the figure in a minute, as the integration between uh, uh, two uh, isobars, P1 and P2, uh, uh, alpha dP. So it's just uh, the integration of this equation. Okay, so the concept of dynamic height comes out of this, uh, where phi p1 minus phi p2 or delta phi can be written as the integral from p1 to p2 of uh, a reference a specific uh, volume, 1 over rho, uh, at some salinity 35, reference temperature of 0, and pressure p minus uh, p1 to p2 alpha v dp, where so this can be written as nu dp, where nu is a function of f, salinity, temperature, and pressure. And that is, of course, 1 over uh, rho stp minus 1 over rho 0, where rho 0 is uh, this particular thing uh, here. Um, so you can write that as rho 0 minus rho stp divided by rho 0 times uh, rho stp. Uh, and rho here is of course uh, rho zero uh, plus delta rho which is small so you can uh, replace this here with rho zero so this becomes rho zero squared so then we have rho zero minus uh, the new stp that we are integrating here can be written as rho zero minus rho stp divided by rho zero squared so that becomes a little simpler so what are we talking about uh, we have the deep motionless ocean uh, which is very deep so above that you have this thermocline in this particular c case it's dipping down um, uh, which means there is convergence so we will so soon see that we will look at um, the uh, subtropical gyre which uh, I will show a figure for. In the active layer you have a uh, surface ocean, free surface uh, of the ocean here uh, where we can set the atmospheric pressure as zero arbitrary constant basically and isobars are tilting uh, this way here on this way here so if you imagine the uh, longitudinal balance so this is meridional uh, direction versus depth uh, you have geostrophic balance giving you currents going away into the page and coming out of the page at us and the motionless uh, condition for the deep ocean requires that we have the velocities diminishing with depth down to the interface uh, where the velocity has to go to zero because we don't have strong shear across this uh, interface by our assumptions and within each uh, of these layers uh, the velocity is constant okay so that's our simple setup um, this is our essential reduced gravity assumption, right? So you have V2 equals 0 and uh, rho equals to rho 2, whereas here you have rho 1 and V varying. Obviously, this is our thermal wind. The gradient of density or temperature here corresponds to the vertical shear. So you remember that part. 
Uh, now you can write the steric height, essentially uh, the uh, change in the free surface elevation because of the density change in the uh, uh, layers below it. So if you go from uh, let's say Z1 to Z2, some layer at pressures uh, depth Z1 to another depth Z2, then that can be written as uh, Z at P2 where the depth uh, at Z2 there is pressure P2 to depth uh, Z1 where the pressure is P1 and you integrate rho 0 minus rho STP divided by rho 0 so you're just integrating the volume change because of the density change uh, in the vertical uh, so you can take uh, some level of no motion which is varying in X and Y so then the steric height uh, uh, for any depth Z1 can be written as ZNM minus Z1 that's the height above the level of no motion times uh, so you are just integrating this part and writing it as uh, rho 0 minus rho at that level and delta Z so ZNM minus Z1 times rho 0 minus rho 2 rho 2 and then you get the other term uh, by integrating so you get minus HXY which is the depth at the uh, no motion minus Z1 so that is uh, up to the depth uh, Z1 times delta rho uh, so that's um, divided by rho 0 so this is looking complicated but it's uh, fairly straightforward if you just uh, integrate this uh, equation right what do we do with it we write the uh, steric height this way and then uh, knowing that Z and nm minus z1 times rho 0 uh, minus rho 2 divided by rho 0 are basically uh, vertically varying uh, same as z1 delta rho or rho 0 so they don't have any horizontal uh, variations uh, in our simplified system so the uh, dis horizontal distribution of the steric height is not affected by those terms so we can rewrite oops uh, that equation uh, simplified as uh, HSXY uh, equal to minus delta rho times HXY divided by rho uh, zero. Okay, so here HXY is obviously much much greater than the uh, steric height. What does that uh, mean? That means the variations in the thermocline depth are. Uh, 100 times larger than the variations in the steric height okay so you move this by 100 meters to move this by uh, 1 meter so that's those are the kind of scales we have so that's obviously uh, valid okay um, then we can use that system to derive rotational waves uh, okay uh, so write the uh, uh, delta H where where, what happened to my okay hmm, I put it all in the wrong uh, order here but let's start here so we have uh, let's say look at this one first so we have uh, uh, tropical trade winds let's stick to the northern hemisphere so you have northeasterly trades and mid-latitude westerlies so if you curl your fingers around it you have a negative curl which is going into the ocean or in the negative Z direction which means there is convergence into the middle and we can also see it as a uh, uh, effect of Coriolis varying with latitude which is in fact the most critical aspect of this so if the trade winds are trying to pull the water towards the west then Coriolis are going to push it to the north and Coriolis effect is lower here in the low latitudes the westerlies are pushing the water to the uh, uh, east and there is a southward uh, push by the Coriolis and Coriolis is greater at higher latitudes beta y so you have more water coming south than going north so you have convergence and southward mass transport and the wind is pu putting in negative vorticity into the ocean so you essentially have to move that water back north and 
produce positive vorticity to balance the negative vorticity put in by the wind so that you don't keep churning the ocean. That's the kind of a quick run. So you essentially end up with this western boundary intensification which I mentioned before and the eastern boundary currents which tend to be broad and slow and shallow whereas the western boundary tends to be narrow, strong and uh, deep. Okay. Uh, if you look at the horizontal view the convergence produces this mound of water in the middle so the water t wants to flow down by gravity and then as soon as you move at large enough scale Coriolis is going to act uh, to the right of the flow so you have the balance between Coriolis and gravity so you have essentially geostrophic flow around this so that's kind of what we are trying to do here. So imagine uh, a longitude latitude section between two latitudes. This is the western uh, part of the gyre or the eddy. Uh, this is the eastern part and this is the southern part and the northern part. So uh, the depth of the thermocline here is H1, depth of the thermocline here is H2 and delta H is this uh, difference between these two uh, isoplets or you can uh, call them as uh, between two geopotentials right so uh, let's look at the geostrophic transport between these two uh, 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 isoplets uh, in this anticyclone in the northern hemisphere clockwise flow is obviously uh, anticyclone and the uh, Latitude y1 uh, is separated uh, from uh, these two points are separated by delta hs, the steric height, which is delta rho times hs1 minus hs2, so 1 and 2, divided by rho. Okay? And uh, y2, similarly, the points at latitude y1 uh, plus delta y, and Fy2 is obviously greater than Fy1 because this is lower latitude and this is the higher latitude. So we are going to just see that the uh, mass transport here is larger because of low F because F in the, is in the denominator uh, as we will see in a minute and the mass transport here is weaker so you have convergence happening here. Similarly on this side we'll see that uh, mass transport is weaker and stronger here so you have a divergence happening. So the thermocline will be lifted here, sea level steric height will be depressed, uh, thermocline will be deepened because of the convergence which means steric height will be increased. So you have a pressure gradient in this direction and the signal is going to propagate westward as Rossby waves. Okay, That's the basic story. So now let's write the equations for that. Delta H, the, the difference uh, between H1 and H2 of the thermocline depth uh, occurring over the, the uh, density difference of delta rho uh, at AB, the lower section on the western side, divided by rho zero. So this steric gradient uh, is going to gr drive, uh, that's the pressure gradient as well, going to drive a geostrophic mass transport which is related to delta H and that's going to be related to the local F as well, right? So the, uh, the, the difference in the mass transport or the convergence then becomes uh, the difference uh, of uh, AB and CD, so the difference between the mass transport here and the mass transport there, which we write as uh, delta MG, so that's GH rho zero times delta Z, uh, times 1 over F2 minus 1 over F1. So mass transport at Y2 minus mass transport at Y1, right? So F1 is smaller, so F2 is larger, so obviously we're going to have convergence in the middle and on the other side similarly we are going to have a divergence, okay? So there is our uh, delta mg, convergence and divergence between the two sections on the west and east, which can be written in terms of the delta h and beta times delta y uh, divided by f0 squared, where um, we are using f, uh, the beta plane approximation to write f1 and f2, and f0 here is essentially the average between the two, so f1 plus f2 divided by 2. So we take the average f between the two uh, latitudes and write the geostrophic uh, 
difference in the f uh, transports uh, with this. What do we want to do now? We want to essentially derive the westward phase speed, which is the, the speed with which the isoplets of uh, uh, steric height or h, the thermocline depth, move. Okay, thermocline depth is not constant. It's going to respond to the mass transport, uh, which is the propagation of the um, thermocline depth. Okay, westward. So you write th the travel time h over delta t in terms of this uh, uh, geostrophic transport um, and simplify it uh, by neglecting the so gh or f0 squared uh, delta h uh, or uh, the delta y cancel here. So you have delta h beta over delta x delta y times delta rho or delta z, uh, rho zero. And again, uh, uh, we can write the uh, h over delta x, h over delta x, just rearranging it, times delta h uh, beta over f0 squared. Uh, times g delta rho over rho zero. So here is our reduced gravity, um, and here is our, uh, we can think of it as our uh, pressure gradient term. Um, and we want to basically find delta x over delta t, which is our phase speed of this uh, signal moving westward. So you have built a mound of water, uh, just like we did uh, during the Kelvin wave, and then it's, we are going to release it, uh, so then we are going to see how the adjustment happens to this uh, forcing, which is our uh, phase speed, which is beta g h uh, delta rho over rho divided by f squared y. Okay, so we are just going to go back to uh, f zero being uh, a function of y, and since f varies with latitude, the phase speed is going to vary with latitude. It'll be order meter per uh, second in uh, low latitudes will reach order centimeter per second at 20 degree uh, latitude and will reach millimeter per second by the time you hit 40 degree latitude. So literally Rossby waves take decades to cross uh, the ocean. So this is a simple way of explaining uh, the rotational effect that comes into the ocean Rossby wave. Okay, very strong rotational uh, effect. So you can draw the uh, dispersion diagram now uh, using the gravity wave speed uh, with reduced gravity and thermocline depth. This is why we have always been saying equivalent depth. And here is where the uh, various modes change their group velocity from westward to eastward, as we remember, as we go to higher wave numbers and small scale waves, they can have uh, eastward group velocities and where that transition from low frequency large scale waves to uh, high frequency, uh, sorry, um, high wave number uh, we eastward uh, group velocity happens uh, is related to uh, this line here. We have the mixed Rossby gravity waves, we have the Kelvin wave, and we have the eastward and westward inertial gravity waves. And for the ocean, if you compare the period, it's much, much slower than the atmosphere, as you can imagine. Heavy uh, density. Uh, and it turns out that in this gray area here, for a period of about a week to uh, 40 days or so, uh, there are no westward uh, propagating uh, group speeds. So why is that important? It turns out that when we want the waves to reflect at the boundaries, we want them to move in a certain direction to move the energy away from the boundaries, right? You don't want to pile up the energy at the boundaries. And in fact, if they do, then you have to find a way of uh, transmitting it away. So that becomes important in terms of which waves uh, behave uh, in what way at the reflection boundary, okay? We will see that in detail. So this is very similar to what we see, uh, what we saw for the atmosphere. But you just have to get used to the the frequencies being very low, much lower than uh, what we saw before, and the periods being much longer than what we saw uh, before. Okay. So I will come to the impact of boundaries in the next podcast. This is a rather long. Uh, podcast but it's okay because these points are very important and I hope uh, it's uh, still comprehensible enough.